All right, I see we have some people starting to um, file into this session. So I want to welcome you as you file in and we'll uh, just give folks another minute before we begin in earnest. So welcome and good morning. All right, I think we're able to sort of get the uh, ball rolling this morning at this uh, particular session. So uh, first of all, uh, welcome and thanks for participating in this UNSC site event entitled "Moving from Data to uh, Moving Data, Moving from Data Production to Impact: A Discussion of the Role of NSOs in Facilitating Greater Data Use." My name is Grant Cameron, and I'm the moderator for this session and the director of SDSN Trends, a global research network with a focus on connecting innovators across data domains to improve data production and use for sustainable development. This session is co-organized by my uh, institution and our colleagues at Open Data Watch and is co-sponsored with our colleagues at the National Institute, Statistical Institute of Jamaica. Before we begin, as always, a couple of housekeeping remarks. We are recording this session. And a second point that might be useful to know is we'll be using a tool to, engage, to gauge your feedback and support and provide any comments that you want to make on what you're about to see through this side of it. So I'm going to set a little bit of context and the stage for uh, what the motivation for this side event is. Um, we've seen in past UNSC and World Development Forum sessions how the pandemic has pushed NSOs to transform and modernize. And these transformations have helped NSOs play a critical role in the pandemic pretty much in two ways. One, by helping their governments perform. During the pandemic, NSO engagement with policymakers put them in the engine room of policymaking and service delivery. With real-time policymaking the norm, New forms of data were needed, joined in new ways, and quickly analyzed. At the World Development Forum webinar in December, we heard a chief statistician from the Dominican Republic describe how her NSO performed by creating new data, by working with their planning ministry to ensure that it was fit for purpose to address key policy questions. Along with improving government performance, NSO change their dissemination schemes to make near real-time data available in ways that was easier for the public to consume through dashboards, accompanying analysis, etc. These actions help government demonstrate its openness, reliability, and fairness, all critical characteristics necessary to be an effective institution uh, during the pandemic. And at our session, at our burn um, a forum on this topic, Canada's chief statistician reported that StatCan's retooled products and dissemination strategies led to a, drupling, a doubling through quadrupling of data use over social media and conventional platforms. Although we've seen these and other success stories of how NSOs changed to increase the uptake of their products by policymakers and the public, the international statistics community remains without a framework to assist NSOs on this transformation process. So in this session, we will introduce the broad elements of a, such a framework, 
that uh, Open Data Watch and ourselves Trends have been working on with the support of our partners at GIZ on behalf of the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. We will then hear from the perspectives of three practitioners engaged in improving the use of NSO products, one from the UN system, taking the global perspective, one from a national statistical office, and then one from a data-minded global civil society organization. Afterwards, we will open it up for your questions. So at this point in the session, I will turn the presentation uh, to Shada and Lorenz, our colleagues at Open Data Watch, to pr uh, provide a, uh, a quick 10 minute uh, overview of this framework. And I'm sure many of you already know our, our colleagues at Open Data Watch, Shada is the managing director there, and Lorenz Noé is their research manager. So we'll take a, we'll uh, pass it over to you, Shada. Thanks. Thanks, Grant, and welcome to everybody. Greetings to you all. Thanks for being here with us. Um, I'm just going to set up the context of the presentation and then hand it over to Lawrence, uh, who's our project manager uh, from our side, uh, to take us through this uh, uh, proposed framework. Uh, the context, I think, was very well set already by Grant. That uh, next slide, please. Uh, that we we are, um, you know, never before um, the world needed data and evidence more than we do now. Um, you know, you're just coming out of the pandemics, we've seen the need for data, gender equality, poverty, uh, and persistent inequality, climate change. But at the same time, it's really a paradox of how much we need data, but at the same time, much of the data that is produced, you know, billions of gigabytes of data being produced is really not used. Some research shows maybe two thirds, 68%, maybe too accurate, two thirds of the data produced actually ends up in date, what we call data graveyards, meaning data is wasted and data is not used. So how can we avoid this? I mean, this is really a, a, a significant problem around data that we need good data, we need to fill the gaps, we need accessible data, we need better governed data, but you know, how can we make the, get more value out of data? Next, please. We've seen that there's been a continuing emphasis on data use. You know, some of this, uh, uh, many of you on, on uh, participating today know these products very well. We started talking about it long time ago, the importance of data, data use. In the 2014, with the world that counts, for example, in the Cape Town Global Action Plan in 2017, um, also in 2017, I worked on an OECD development cooperation report where we put really data at the data use at the center of how do we change the, the sort of the, 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 the virtual cycle that many of the NSOs are caught in by having poor capacity leading to poor support for data, leading to poor quality and trust in data and so on. And, and data use really was identified as a key to turning this, this into a virtuous cycle and really breaking this old pattern of low use of data and low trust in data and low support for data. So, we, we need to follow that up. And of course, the World Development Report this year has a very important emphasis on data use, as is what we discovered, what we covered at the World Data Forum and also in the Burn the Data Compact uh, for the Decade of Action. So we have data use is really been at the front and center, and we really is time for us to kind of demystify it and do something as around of how can we set a framework, how can we you know, come together with the same terminology and you know, working together and how can we help uh, NSOs uh, learn from NSOs who are doing this very well, but also share with other NSOs what are the areas where they can look at, assess their own capacity and look at this as a service, you know, data use as a service as how they can improve, improve it. Next, please. We have seen from the from the data value chain, a number of lessons that we've learned is that you know everybody comes together uh, agreeing that 
to get the value out of data, we really need to be mindful of all the steps that the data has to go through. But also we've learned that when we have a simple uh, way of describing data value and you know, being able to communicate it, we, you know, we, we have a step forward. Data value chain is one of the most used products of what we have produced in uh, in open data watch and i'm always amazed from the data that we produce that how much is used you know some companies in fact use it translated to many languages is used in many classes uh, and also in some companies actually you know uh, using it as a guide companies not even national statistical officers so it's a good lesson for us that's it that if we you know, if we translate uh, if a complex framework like a data use into something that we can communicate, maybe we can use it and get much much more advantage out of it. So let's 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 see if we can succeed in that. And I'm gonna, you know, next slide, please. And I'm gonna now hand it in to Lawrence to take us through this, uh, what we call a transformation process for data use and sort of get your feedback and uh, your comments on that. Over to you, Lawrence. Thanks so much, Shada and Grant for introducing this project and to Shada for um, really setting the, setting the stage for this. Um, next slide, please. So I really wanted to take you through this transformation process uh, that we've come up with so far and that we're hoping to uh, get more feedback on from NSOs and um, all the great data practitioners we have around the webinar and that we know are part of this greater community. So what does the world look like with and without this transformation process? In terms of challenges, um, as shown on the left-hand side, uh, we need to overcome a lack of data use and decision-making, data governance that limits data use or at the very least doesn't promote it, a general lack of trust and awareness of NSO data across the user spectrum, and weak feedback loops between users and producers of NSO data. The state we want to get to on the right-hand side is characterized by increased evidence-informed decision-making, improved government services, and better results tracking to hold governments to account. But how do we get there? We see this as a problem chiefly of NSO capacity, namely the capacity to govern data, meet the needs of users, and to use data, both from the NSO and citizen perspective. Certain conditions, such as the political will to implement changes in procedures and, and policies, the financing needed to improve these capacities, and the technical infrastructure that's part of certain solutions for improving data use are not part of this framework, but we recognize that they will act as supports or constraints on the ability of an NSO to act. Next slide, please. So I want to briefly cover each of these three capacity aspects and what we mean by them. First, we have the need to improve the capacity to govern data, which involves developing national and organizational strategies and policies that enable data use and build all the way to creating a culture of data use within the NSO and as part of these feedback loops that we mentioned. This is enabled by planning documents, for example, such as national strategies for the development of statistics and data sharing policies as well as human resources that will create teams that can upskill and take a user perspective in statistical production efforts. New Zealand, for example, has a data stewardship strategy that's well known that empowers the government chief data steward to enable greater data use. And as we heard yesterday in an event on open data, countries like Trinidad and Tobago are recognizing the shared responsibility of data use across the NSO, which presents challenges, but also opportunities. Laws and regulations around privacy, data privacy and NSO mandates are also part of the governance frameworks that can enable data use. Ghana, for example, in its updated Statistical Service Act, highlights the importance in oper operationalization of ethics for production and use of statistics. Next slide, please. Next, we have the need to improve the capacity to meet the needs of users. This is part and parcel of strengthening feedback loops between users and producers. As data producers need to be able to recognize demand, by knowing who their users are and what data they want. The continued publication of statistics through portals and other forms of dissemination remain undoubtedly part of data use approaches. It's high time to focus on the needs of users and their motivations to use data. Tools like portals and APIs themselves, um, which are great tools for dissemination, themselves need to be analyzed for use if they exist. Uh, statistics Poland, for example, has shown that they get millions of requests through their API every day. And those requests themselves are examples of a feedback loop. 
Civics Malaysia, meanwhile, has organized a series of hackathons, for example, that create evolving connections with institutions of higher learning. The demands of users as defined by the NSO will be the most important demands, but existing guidelines on data production and dissemination from domestic and international sources can also act as signals of what is being demanded. For example, the Special Data Dissemination Standard Plus and the Enhanced General Data Dissemination System from the IMF, as well as the UNN's Statistical Quality Assurance Framework are just a selection of international standards that are out there. A feedback loop is really a continuous way of interacting between users and producers that will keep both sides engaged, which is why the previous bucket on policies and strategies has to enable to NSO to spend time and money on this. Next slide, please. Finally, we need to improve the capacity to use data. This refers to both users in terms of their data literacy, which covers basic education, another area where that kind of straddles with NSOs can and can't control, but certainly working with statistics, NSOs and NSS entities can be powerful partners for increasing skills. Harking back to knowing your audience, these skills will vary across types of users, whether they're from civil society, private companies, or media outlets. <clears throat> for a selection, um, UNSD, for example, maintains statistical literacy initiatives and inventory that combines a lot of existing efforts to educate users about data. Similarly, depending on the solutions to these data use challenges, producers have to continually upskill in terms of data and communication. They're obviously the experts and have much more background and statistics and data than the average user, but integrating new type data types, uh, for example, that responds to demands for data by citizens and the ability to publish data in a user-friendly way and to put in place the mechanisms for continuous uh, feedback loops all these need skills that need to be continually trained. Courses such as those for communicating gender statistics from Paris 21 are just some of the tools available. Next slide, please. The final product of this transformation process is to pair this high level framework that I've just presented with country case studies, including on gender data. So the countries are able to see what could work in their context and chart a way forward to improving data use. What I've shared so far is just a brief selection of country examples. We'll be sure to go into greater detail in a final report. <clears throat> so what we've shared today um, is just our first step. We're now entering into this consultative part of our work. We're presenting this framework at events like the one today, and we're sharing a live document of the transformation process with you here um, in the chat and after the event. We're also planning to send out a survey to NSOs and experts uh, to further gather feedback on this framework and to hear about their challenges and solutions for better data use. We'll also have in-depth engagement with a smaller number of NSOs and we'll share the transformation process and country examples that result from these consultations in a final report later this year. Um, we're really excited about this work and look forward to um, all of the feedback that we get. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Grant. Great. Thanks so much, Lorenz and Sheda, for a great presentation. Um, and yeah, you'll note that in the chat box now, there is a link to this sort of live document that provides more information on this framework. And I think just to reiterate Lorenz's last point, this is a, we are really trying to take a intensively consultative process in order to sort of get this right. This is not some work that's being done in a vacuum. This is the work that is really trying to draw from a lot of great work that's gone on in the past. And we really want to make sure that it customizes in sensible ways to country circumstances. So I would encourage you to not click the link now because we have three great presentations coming up. So just hold off a bit. But before we get to three great presentations, we do want to engage the audience uh, a little bit right now by asking a quick question. So I think a question is going to appear uh, right now, hopefully, if you're with us, there is a question that's appeared on your screen, which calls, which basically kind of aligns a little bit ar uh, around the, uh, the um, elements that Lorenz described in this framework. So one thing that we were interested in is which of the following data use capacity gaps from your perspective most impact your day-to-day -day work? So, you know, we've heard basically three big components of this framework. There's the sort of that foundational governing aspect um, that's so essential. Again, when, uh, when we had our burn webinar on this, people said we would be nowhere without sort of the right kinds of governs, laws, uh, protocols for data sharing. Um, is it more meeting the needs of users? Um, this is more on the goods producing side. Do you, are you aware of what data your, your users need? And can you create that data to meet that need? 
And then facilitating data use is really more on the service provision side from an NSO perspective. Um, do you know your client segments well enough to convert that data into useful information for them to consume? So if you can click one of these, and it could be other, who's to say it could be something else because there are obviously other components that could um, inhibit data use. But if we could get you to click a button and let us know, that would be very helpful. Um, and um, I think what we'll do is um, um, we'll, we'll just uh, see if we can't share the results um, uh, maybe a little bit later in the, uh, in the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn to our panelists now um, and I'm going to sort of see, uh, we're going to get their perspectives um, on some of the challenges they're facing and some of the actions they're taking to overcome these challenges. So first up is Ms. Carol Coy, who's the Director General of the Statistical Institute of Jamaica. And she's going to be giving us her experiences of her statistical office. So Carol, the next nine minutes is yours. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Grant. And um, I really am honored to be here to presenting, looking at it from the perspective of an NSO, and especially what um, a small island developing state. OK. Um, can you put it in slide mode? Thanks. The next slide for me. OK, so we're looking at, first of all, I look at the challenges facing national statistical offices. Um, there is obviously the demand for data, and this has expanded significantly um, with the adoption of the SDGs and the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what we realize is that data needs to be timely and there is the need for it to be disaggregated. And what we are suffering from is with the rapid improvement in technology, users are now accustomed to getting information in the shortest possible time. So I need something, I go to Google, I search and I get it. And I think we are now under pressure to be able to produce this information so that persons can get it in a timely manner. Next slide, please. So when you have in NSOs in, developing countries and especially small island developing states, there is the resource constraints and you also have an underdeveloped national statistics system. During the COVID period, you had a reduction in budgetary support um, as governments had to transfer resources um, for COVID mitigation. And at the same time, you, you are being required to produce data. So national statistical offices like ours face the dilemma of prioritizing production. Do you keep the same um, data that you usually produce or do you now switch to producing what is required? So what we found is that as NSOs, we have to find ways to satisfy current users and to meet that growing demand. But there was a um, upside to this because what happened during this period, there was this new interest in and the demand for data. And it provided an opportunity for NSOs to um, highlight the relevance of information and for us to get ourselves out there so persons see what it is that we are producing and how we can produce and the, and the need for the data that we produce. Next slide. So looking at it from an NSO statin, um, how did we respond to this urgent data need? Because with the COVID, we realized that there was this need to produce information quickly, urgently. And we realized that traditional approaches to data production and analysis would not satisfy this need. In the, you, you, what you had was countries being locked down, um, curfew periods. You were not able to use your traditional approaches of going face to face um, to do it. So non-traditional approach to the gathering data would be required. It's, it's, it's a issue we recognized early. What we also recognized also was that dissemination would also have to be prioritized. So it's not just producing this information, but how do you get the information out in the public and to government so they can make decisions? Next slide. So the response from us again was we realized that we needed to improve the coordination 
of research and production of data regarding the impact of COVID-19. In Jamaica, this was operationalized through the creation of what we call the National Research Agenda for COVID-19. Next slide. So um, how this research agenda was structured is that research would focus on clinical and laboratory um, aspects, epidemiological surveillance, health systems, socioeconomic, but critical to the research agenda was communication. So there was a segment dealing with how would you communicate what it is you have found. And an important part of this is to link this research to policy. So the research agenda included policymakers because what we needed to find out what it is that they need to make the policy and our research would have been targeted around this. Next slide. So the focus of the NSO was around the socioeconomic research agenda. Um, this was co-chaired by Statin, which is the NSO and the Ministry of Health and Wellness. It included a wide, it includes, it's still operational, a wide cross-section of stakeholders. And this would be across government, academia, and the primary and the private sector. The primary goal of the research agenda is to provide relevant and timely information for policy and decision-making during this time of crisis. So the focus is to provide data for policy and decision-making and to improve coordination, to optimize research efforts and outcomes in a whole of society response to producing data. So one of the things we hoped to achieve in that is to reduce um, duplication. And so you would have academia getting grants to do research. So what we would ensure is all these research would have been coalesced around this research agenda in providing data. Next slide. So the socioeconomic research agenda looked at government and public private partnerships. It looked at society and household and the impact of, of, of the COVID. And we also looked at business industry and trade. So it was a wide area that we were seeing how we did the COVID impact the Jamaican economy. Um, next slide. So what was the outcome of this research agenda? What we found was engagement with critical stakeholders, um, including the NSO and other public sector agencies, academia and private sector. Um, for a long time, I haven't seen this coalescing of, um, of all critical stakeholders and the research agenda continues and it will go beyond um, COVID. It was the first time we did a nationally represented telephone survey undertaken by the organization. And what this forced us to do was to collaborate with the private sector, because we had to work with our mobile telephone providers to produce a representative sample for the survey. So this is a way that we can move forward. Increased use of administrative data, it also forced us to see what administrative data there was. There was a weakness in some administrative data, it's not in the structure that allows for um, assessment and analysis. But what this will do is allow us to see where we need to invest in allowing administrative data to be used more efficiently. And it, what we also found for us is you don't have to create a new survey to get data. You could add modules, which is what we did to provide data on the impact of surveys. And we also realized that there is data in you know, our regular surveys that you can um, repurpose and reconfigure to provide information that persons need. Um, next slide. So dissemination, again, I said, is, it was a critical part of it. And we moved our dis dissemination to um, access to data was given priority, as I said. Um, the dissemination of statistics mainly through the web. Um, it was in open data format using DataZoo. We used DataZoo and SDMX. The increased use of infographics. What we have realized is that our data users 
tables, the regular tables do not attract um, data users. Um, the, the persons who are involved in analysis, et cetera, will do that. But what you need is inf increased use of infographics. We found that when we use infographics, the media would just take this and put it um, on, on a page. And so you, you've got much more widespread use of it. The increased use of social media um, or presence on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, that was critical. And the increase of the media through press briefs, um, radio discussions. I know as statisticians, we tend not to like to go out there, but um, during this period, because we had to explain to our users the impact, it forced us to, um, to go through this process. And what we have found is we have had virtual press briefings and we are getting persons calling us. Can you invite us? Can you put us on your Zoom link when you are having this? So for us in Jamaica, this was the way we found to improve the use of, um, of data. Thanks for, uh, for having me. Thanks very much, Carol. And I, I think, um, you know, your presentation was was great. It was very grounded in in how how a, uh, a you know a small island state statistical office really had to change the way that they were operating in order to sort of meet the new recognize the demands as well as meet those demands both with new data products and with new data services. So I think that's a really really nice. Um, um, sort of uh, situating us very, very well into, uh, into the country circumstances. And um, you know, I think we'll pivot back to, uh, if you have questions for Carol, we'll, we'll save them until the end of the, uh, the other two presentations. And so I think at this stage, I'll, I'll pass us now to Ms. Francesca Perucci, who I think is well known by all of you, and if not, will be well known by the end of this side event series uh, through the course of the next two weeks, because she appears in many of them. Francesca is the assistant director of the N Statistics Division, and she's going to be uh, giving us a sense of what, from her global perspective, what actions are being taken to support data use and uptake in statistical offices. Over to you, please, Francesca. Thank you, Grant. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to uh, my colleagues at Trends and, and ODW uh, to invite me to, for inviting me to be part of this uh, discussion. There is a topic that is uh, very close to my heart. Uh, if we refer to <coughs> the, <coughs> excuse me, to the ODW framework that we just uh, seen earlier, it is clear that we need to improve uh, capacity to govern data, uh, meet uh, users' needs, and, and improve the use of data overall. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'd like to refer to what can be done at the global level uh, to promote a culture where users uh, are also data owners throughout the data value chain and, and working on the normative side also, offering guidance and international recommendations, which is in uh, the role of the UN Statistical Commission in large part. <clears throat> but there is also a need to improve capacity in countries uh, to ensure that data are relevant and that users are effectively engaged, uh, to provide guidance and tools so that national statistical offices can take a user-centric approach and implement open data policies and practices, uh, but also to help countries to develop the institutional and legal frameworks to facilitate uh, data exchange, use and reuse, and to ensure data quality, as was mentioned earlier by uh, Lawrence, and protection of data privacy and confidentiality. But I'd like to stress that we also need strong foundational data systems and agile national statistical systems that can quickly adapt to changing demands, to changing circumstances, as we've seen, of course, in the case of COVID-19. So the data remain relevant and really meet users' needs as that demand changes rapidly. Next slide, please. Now, the role of NSOs has evolved and uh, with increased understanding uh, of and attention uh, to users' needs. And, and obviously COVID-19 has accelerated that process uh, with increased public interest in data. We've seen that very clearly from Carol's presentation, a higher appreciation of data as a key asset to inform measures and policies and better involvement of national statistical offices in decision-making. Also the role of NSOs is expanding uh, so that they become stewards uh, for data across the whole data system. And here the work by the Working Group on Data Stewardship of the UN Statistical Commission can really help 
in providing guidance on overall data governance and, and legal frameworks that facilitate the use and reuse of data and the expansion or the development of the necessary legal frameworks to allow for that. And also changes in data governance practices and architectures overall and policies and practices to ensure inclusive and equitable data use, enabling uh, widespread use by uh, all different uh, stakeholders in society and, and fostering the inclusion of different data communities uh, throughout the whole value, uh, data value chain. But also uh, it's, uh, guidance is needed for better coordination across the whole data system uh, for sharing and, and collaboration to increase data, uh, the use of data in society. And those are some of the work streams that the data group uh, the sorry, the working group on data stewardship is is focusing on. A uh, new slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, also, the global level, and this was mentioned also by by Sheda in her introduction. We have uh, a call for actions and commitments made by the Bern uh, Data Compact the, for the Decade of Action on SDGs that was launched at the UN World Data Forum in October last year. Uh, the Bern Data Compact calls very clearly for better data use. It calls on all data producers to safeguard data privacy and confidentiality and balance this with data use and sharing. It calls on the private sector to share more data and make it accessible so that it can be used in a responsible manner in full respect of privacy and confidentiality. It also calls on the promotion of data literacy and the empowerment uh, of the general uh, public to use data. But the compact also makes specific commitments and ask for commitments by government, the private sector and the media to present data in a timely, open and impartial manner and for governments to establish good governance systems to safeguard privacy and confidentiality and rights of individuals, but also maintain transparency and accessibility. So we have tools and, and as was mentioned earlier, we, the, the, the issue of data use was present in many of the international tools and agreements uh, over the last, I would say, at least two or three decades. Uh, next slide, please. But how can we achieve all that? Uh, what are the activities that, that can help countries strengthen their capacity so that they can respond better to users' needs? Uh, they need to ensure that data are relevant, develop effective user engagement strategies, and, and implement open data policies and practices. Many of the ongoing initiatives and projects uh, are already focused on this, and I, I'd like to just mention a few, the user-centric approach of the Data for Now initiative for better data uh, for SDGs. Uh, the UNSD FCDO project on SDG monitoring that has a strong component on the development of user engagement strategies. Uh, the e-learning tools produced by the Global uh, Network of Institution for Statistical Training, the GIST, they focus, uh, focus on uh, data and statistical literacy. Uh, the visualization toolkits that is produced by our division in collaboration with various partners to help uh, national statistical offices with data presentations and uh, visualizations. Uh, but also I want to stress how important it is to work on inclusive data to ensure that all different data communities are in involved, engaged in the uh, data production and in the whole uh, data value chain. And in that context, the work on uh, citizen generated data and citizen science can really help ensure not only that citizens participate in data production, but also become more aware of the importance of data and its impact on, on decision making at, at all levels. I also would like to, to say that in our collaboration with countries, what we see with many, if not most of the countries we are engaged with, uh, once we launch the, the new initiatives, we see that they already have a vision for a user-centric approach. They already have a strong uh, desire to uh, implement open data policies and, and really ensure the, that they are able to meet the, the, the needs of users. And they already have ongoing you know, initiatives on their own uh, to, to enable them. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like just to show a few examples, uh, but in the interest of time, of course, I would encourage if we can share the slides, we also included some of the links on the slides in, for each of the respective uh, areas of work. For those who are interested, they can uh, access more information. One example is the Data for Now 
uh, initiative that among its principles has one specifically on the commitment of all partners to only work on data that meet user needs and national pr uh, priorities. So what is needed for decision making at the national level. And as part of the project, uh, we organize sessions and workshops that really focus on create, creating a data culture among decision makers, uh, but also mobilizing resources for it and bringing all relevant partners to the table. Uh, next slide, please. Another initiative that I'd like to refer to is the preparation of um, uh, user engagement strategies and tools for data presentation and dissemination that is part of the uh, work of the UNSTSCDO project on SDGs that has a very strong uh, user engagement uh, focus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and what we see in, in this slide is the data visualization toolkit that is prepared uh, uh, to offer tools such as icons, infographics, uh, templates to produce user-friendly data publications, data stories, because uh, this is, of course, one area of work that is very important, uh, irrespective of, of the data sets that we're able to integrate and put together. Uh, if, even if we have open data practices that enable us to bring all the data sets together and, and, and with uh, the, the right interoper interoperability tools, unless we translate that into real data stories that can be easily accessible and understandable by a wide uh, audience, it's hard for data to be fully utilized. Uh, next slide, please. And last, uh, I, I'd like to show uh, what was uh, prepared uh, by the, what's been prepared, and it's been ongoing, of course, uh, the work of the GIST uh, the, on, on, uh, on uh, training specifically focused on statistical literacy, and also the microlearning videos on the role of official statistics in decision making, among other, other products that they, they have uh, produced. Uh, and, and I think even the microlearning videos that are very short and, and very uh, sort of can be consumed in a, in a very quick uh, manner. Uh, they offered the sense of, you know, the importance of, of data for policy making, and those can be easily shared, you know, with policy makers in, uh, in, in, in various countries. So this is all I wanted to share for today. And, and thanks again for having me part of the panel. Over to you, Grant. Thanks very much, Francesca. That was uh, very thorough and, and very inspiring. I think we all saw that the, uh, you know, the international statistical community and certainly the UN has really fully embraced this sort of user-centric approach uh, to support the NSOs to Im improve in this direction through a range of things that are working at the global public good level, like the sort of the announcements that have come out of Bern, some of the tools that have been demonstrated, some of the work streams that were articulated like the, uh, the data stewards workshop or work stream, as well as the connections to, to country engagement to create that important feedback loop to uh, ensure that this work is kind of grounded in what countries really need. So um, I think it's, I think it's um, great. And of course, I think as this framework evolves and develops, uh, we'll be referring and referencing to a lot of these tools and uh, that are currently engaged because they're, they're quite strong. I think as we pivot to our final presenter, one thing that um, Francesca mentioned quite clearly in her presentation was the need for inclusive data and ensuring that the data that was generated really does capture the needs of all facets and members of society. And I think that makes for a nice pivot to our third and final panelist and presenter today, um, is Claudia Wells, who's the Director of Data Use at Development in in Initiatives. And uh, this is really very much in her wheelhouse. So um, without further ado, I'll pass it to Claudia and the next nine minutes is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grant. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this panel and for the organizers for highlighting such an important issue. It's really our duty as champions of these data systems to ensure that the data that we advocate for is not ending up in data graveyards. And I think when people talk about improved data use, it's often in the same breath as productivity and innovation. Data should be making us faster. Machine learning and AI algorithms can improve public services and kind of really inform decisions at scale. And of course, they absolutely can. Um, but that wasn't really the reflection that I wanted to take today. I wanted to reflect that sometimes by putting data use 
right at the heart of everything that we're doing as a data community should sometimes actually make us slower, not because we're not being responsive, but because, as you say, Grant, we're being inclusive. Um, and by, in fact, relentlessly focusing on data use, we've got a real tool here that will help us balance between the dimensions of quality, um, things like the timeliness and the coverage, but it will also help us balance some of those risks. So if I can um, move on to the next slide, please. One of the cornerstones of uh, our commitment at development initiatives to um, leave no one behind is that in order for people to count, you need to count people. Um, births need to be registered, uh, visits to health facilities need to be recorded, and progress through schools needs to be monitored. Service delivery requires good public administration, which in turn requires good data. But still, many of us face the problem similar to the one articulated very succinctly here on this slide. But it's not just from a data production perspective that we need to look at this. And if you look to my next slide, there's another great quote here that I think really sums up why data use is really so important from a user perspective. This project coordinator from Nepal, from the Campaign for Human Rights and Social Transformation, sees data use as a vital enabler for social change, and that's why it's so important. If we could go to the next slide, please. We're all aware that we're living through a time where the focus on data has never been sharper, and the national statistical system centered around the National Statistics Office is right in the crosshairs of that focus. And it's really risen to the challenge. Um, the fantastic examples that we've heard from colleagues on this panel about how the NSOs have really responded to that absolutely enormous increasing demand and scrutiny on data, and not just from their traditional users. We're talking about citizens um, looking at data in a different way than they ever have before, people looking at data way beyond our standard data community. But for those of us who've been working on data ecosystems for some time, the pandemic has really just highlighted many of the issues that we already knew about. The need for more timely data. The fact that the most vulnerable, those experiencing the greatest need are often those are the ones who are missing from our statistics and official data. But also that the big global data sets aren't really useful for this very timely needed um, and locally driven response that's required. We need something that's delivered and owned locally, but also globally connected. And if I can go to the next slide, please. The most successful solutions, as you've seen with some examples from my previous colleagues, really put data use at the heart of the response. And if we put data use at the center of some of these long-standing problems, we have a real opportunity to take the learning and the best practice that we've seen in the response to this pandemic and really transform our statistical systems. This slide is a simple data use framework that can be applied in a range of settings, kind of from national level um, to subnational level, even for individual projects. Importantly, though, um, where I work at Development Initiatives, we see this data use as a cycle. It's not something that happens at the end of the data value chain. It needs to be embedded throughout the data value chain. That means including users in the production and design, as well as the analyst and analysis and uptake. And this framework ensures that our thinking is about the users at each stage of the value chain so that data becomes analysis ready because it's the analyst who's using the data, but then analysis becomes decision ready because they're the ones who are using that data. And if I could move to the next slide, please. The first step though in this journey is always understanding who your users are and what their needs are. And also what data and information you have available. At DI, we've been working with national actors on the role of national and subnational data to inform decisions for over 10 years. And out of this work, we've developed an approach that we call data landscaping. Its scope covers both the political economy of data, the structures and standards that govern data collection, data sharing, and the information systems themselves. But importantly, 
we also look at the culture that drives the demand and use of data. And if I could move to the next slide. When we apply this framework, as we have in many settings and in many different contexts, we see a similar pattern of problems. And it's not dissimilar to those challenges that the national statistics offices have been facing during this pandemic. And there are three key findings here that really reflect this and reflect the issues of the sub-national user. If we can solve these problems at use at the sub-national level, then the quality, robust, disaggregated data should flow upwards through the system. So traditional services aren't, surveys aren't meeting the needs of local governments, but administrative systems suffer from poor data quality. And there's a really important point here. The poor data quality is because actually they're not being used by local government. And often we think of use um, being increased if quality increases, but actually use in itself increases quality. Um, and importantly, um, that um, data that's collected at the local level, they're not invested in, in, in improving that quality because the use isn't happening at the local level. It's being extracted for upwards reporting. If I could move to the next slide. And if you reflect on what's happening at the very national level, um, this is one of our most common findings, and I'm sure many people um, on this call will uh, resonate with this. If you don't know what you've got, you can't use it. There's no central repository where information can be found. There's no way to understand what can be used. But also, if there's no effective data sharing, if you aren't able to share what you have, others can't use it either. So you're hampered in several directions. And if I could move to the next slide, please. So we think one of the greatest opportunities to resolve these problems lies, in our opinion, in improved and transparent data governance. National statistics offices creating a transparent mapping of their available data against their statistical needs in an indicator framework. So here, their needs are defined by the indicators required for the national development plan, the sector strategies, and other national priorities. And you can add into that the regional and global frameworks as well and then see that most of those indicators are made up of a series of data elements, manipulated according to agreed and quite often standardized methods. And those components can be mapped into a central data dictionary. And then finally, you complete an inventory of information systems. And this mapping from indicators to sources reveals both gaps in the system where you've got indicators with no data being produced, duplication within the system where you've got vast number of sources and data elements that can be used to supply the indicators, but also redundancies where we see this data ending up in graveyards because it's being produced and not used. And if I could move to the next slide. This is an example of it in practice. And it's just a small sample of SDG6 related indicators from Uganda. And this slide is messy. I'm not expecting you to be able to read all of it, but just to be able to see, I suppose, the messiness of it, because that's exactly the point. We've got multiple sources being used to create multiple data elements with vast duplication within the system. And this is all revealed by just providing a well-organized system of transparent data governance. So now you can see where the problems are. And if I could move to the next slide, please. When you put the user at the heart of the local data ecosystem, it becomes clear that the use of data at the point of service delivery, at the point of data collection is key. And this both drives data quality, like I said before, but also provides you with the key elements of a foundational and sustainable data ecosystem, which is what we've tried to represent on this slide. So this is data being collected in every health clinic, every registry office, and every school flowing up to the subnational level, but also flowing up to the national level. So it's being both used locally and nationally. And if I could move to the next slide. So what are the lessons that we should take away? And the first is that we must make long-term commitments to foundational data systems. I'm echoing my colleagues here. Long-term commitments require long-term funding. We've got to break out of the short-term investment cycles 
But importantly, also at country level, this means we must support those foundational systems with domestic funding as well. As we develop, develop these systems, we must also develop alongside that the data sharing frameworks. And again, this, this really um, uh, um, aligns with the transformation framework that you've been talking about. But again, that that's not free. Funding is essential to support the capability to develop stewardship. We don't want data graveyards. And I've been thinking, actually, maybe we should end on thinking about what we really want if we're going to focus on the national data user throughout the data value chain. And I've been thinking about it. People talk about data warehouses, data lakes, but that didn't really speak to putting the user at the heart for me. So I'm going to leave you with an analogy that I've been thinking about, and it's a data kitchen, a space where the National Statistics Office is our Michelin starred chef using basic foundational ingredients with innovative flavors and new methods to bake using their ever evolving data engineering and data science skills into something that we hope the customer will really enjoy and consume. But of course, you've got to remember that whatever you create has to be edible or it will just end up in the bin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claudia. And thanks for the analogy to cooking um, at the end. That was very good. I, I mean, I think you've echoed some really important points about the importance of data use that's sort of vital and an enabler for social change. I think that sort of takes us back to some of my introductory remarks on, on how NSOs are really contributing almost to trust in government, not only through delivering more performance with better data and services, but through sort of um, making this information transparent, um, you know, doing it on a, on a uh, consistent basis and just creating more of a sense of, of trust in, in the public that they're able to hold governments accountable. So I think those are very, very important notes. Um, so thanks for all three panelists. Um, I think at this stage, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pivot to questions and answers, but before we do that, we're gonna give you the, um, the results of the, uh, the poll. I don't know if someone can, yep, someone has put the results on the poll on the screen, thank you. And I, I sort of, for those of you who checked in early in our presentation, we were asking you to really comment on what you saw as the bottleneck for better data use through the, from your perspective, primarily as national statistic, national statisticians. And we gave you four choices. Um, this notion of sort of the um, institutional arrangements that govern data and allow its use, meeting the needs of users, um, how uh, data has to sort of evolve and the actual product of the data evolve to meet user needs. And then finally, how you can facilitate data use by really understanding the capability of your users and then sort of translating your data into information for those users to consume it effectively. And I, I, I personally, I'm not super surprised by the outcome, but heartened by the outcome for our work here on this framework because what we're finding is that most folks, at least who've responded to the poll, I think half of you responded, were um, saying that really the institutional circumstances and that foundation was not the major barrier. Um, about one in five of you said that was the case. Not really surprising because I think uh, national statistical offices have really been working on that sort of um, enabling foundation of, of policies and regulations to move that ahead. But it's still a significant number of you who have said that. And then it was almost a tie. I'm not, I'm almost afraid to say a statistical tie. There's too much sophistication in this audience. But you'd see that these two challenges that are the other sort of fundamental pillars of this framework, meeting the needs of users, and then the service provision of facilitating that data use are pretty much neck and neck at 37% and 40% respectively. So I think that should hearten uh, those of us working on this framework because it's pretty clear that um, you know, we've, we've got sort of pillars or components of this that really do have um, a large majority of this community seeing that as a significant obstacle. And I think as we move ahead, we'll really be working hard by sort of drawing into this framework uh, many of the tools that were highlighted today, as well as many others, and document more country experiences to inform how these and processes go. So um, I think it's a uh, thank you for your participation in the in the poll. And I think that's that's heartening for us. 
Um, before people start to check off, in case they do, we've got 15 minutes for question and answers. Just a, a quick highlight that we do have a more um, expansive document that describes this framework that we've put in the Google chat, and we are encouraging you to make comments on it. I think we have a structure in place that since we know who you are through your registration, we may be following up with a questionnaire sometime in the future to get more specific information for you. So we do have a kind of a semi-formalized approach uh, to garner more uh, consultation on this framework. And I think if you've been listening to some of these presentations, you'll be inspired, hopefully, to really think about um, how you can help us uh, move this ahead. So I'm thanking you in advance for your comments and, uh, and your considerations on helping us improve and develop and expand this, this framework. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to a couple of questions. Um, I think I'm gonna start with that. These are just ones that came in the question and answer box. Um, I think that we have three, there's time to ask. Um, oh, there's, a, there's another one popping up. So I'm gonna just start with the first one. I think it's something I'm going to ask all three of our panelists to reflect on, and I'm going to sort of ask perhaps Carol to go first, and then Francesca, and then Claudia. And uh, Mohamed Salimi is asking, um, I think that formalizing and creating specific tools for the dialogue between NSOs and users is key to accelerate better, the better use of statistics. Uh, what do you think? So in terms of kind of coming up with a, a tool, a process documentation um, to allow us to sort of understand how to get those dialogues going, um, Mohammed feels might be an important way of formalizing and improving that dialogue. Uh, and so I'm just going to ask perhaps Carol from her experience through the, uh, the, the establishment of this research coordination mechanism and then through uh, the work of both Francesca at the global level and, and Claudia from her perspective, what they would think about having a tool. So over to Carol first, please. Thanks, Grant. Um, I, I think a tool would, would help. Um, what tools do is rather than you have to develop some system, especially in um, small offices that do not have resources, what it does, it lays a framework and allows you to, um, to follow this and, and, and for consistency. So it can help in, um, in, uh, in making it easier for NSOs and for stakeholders and for stakeholders to see how it is that they can um, get, have dialogue with the NSO in, in, in providing the type of information that, that they need. Thank you very much. Uh, Francesca, do you want to chip in on this question? Yeah, the tool. Uh, I, I don't think I see a tool, a specific tool, because I see this as a process. Uh, so I think you start with, uh, of course, having a, a strategy for, the, for the, the whole statistical system to engage with users. Uh, but you need to uh, allow for, you know, users to engage at many different levels from the from as it was said throughout the discussion this morning from the very beginning of the data value chain even before the data value chain starts i would say right when the priorities are set and all that so i think uh, it's probably a question of multiple tools and multiple platforms for engagement and where citizens can play a role and can really engage and understand you know and, and make their demand well understood, and then for all parts of the system to engage. Uh, over to you, uh, Grant. Great, thank you very much. And Claudia, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think I think I would support the thing uh, of looking at this as a as a process, um, and and the need to engage throughout that process. And that's why sometimes we really need to slow down and listen, um, listen, listen to people and and to citizens. And those feedback loops are are so important, the feedback loops that that, uh, that Lorenz was talking about at, at the start in terms of um, ensuring that we're not just, it's not just a engagement sort of box ticking exercise, but this is a real dialogue. Um, and, I, and I think, yes, yes, a tool and a framework does help, but there's lots of other things and lots of other support. Um, I think both citizens, 
um, or, or, other, or other users, in fact, need in order to facilitate that dialogue with the NSO, as well as the NSO to develop um, some, some kind of really step out of their comfort zone sometimes. They're, they really need to become the data advocate, I guess. Um, and, and so we need to support both sides of that, of that dialogue, in my, in my opinion. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I, I'll now turn to our uh, presenters. I see uh, Shada, I think, has her hand up. Uh, so I presume she wants to jump in on this one. Go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that tools are also very useful for, for example, for understanding who are your users and whether they need to be segmented. You know, journalists maybe need a different approach uh, to um, getting data use from, uh, let's say, ministers and policymakers and researchers. So tools are really useful for that segmentation. Also, tools are tremendously important for measuring. Uh, use and and sort of finding out who's using it and sort of also who's not using it. So I think you know use is not only use is also a, a very good back office, if you will, tool for improving data use services. Thank you. Very good. Thanks very much. Um, we have another sort of uh, two questions that sort of um, speak a little bit to um, the connectivity between sort of the use of data and these efforts to sort of extend use and it's linked to sort of demonstrating its value. Um, so we have uh, one, one colleague from Spain who, is, uh, in, who said that they are working to make more parliamentary data more accessible and understandable to people and face a huge challenge because government doesn't necessarily see the need and importance for this. So there's a sort of this value proposition of trying to work very hard to sort of make data accessible where there are times where perhaps leadership doesn't see the value in that. And I think um, a colleague of ours from the Inter-American Development Bank is always, uh, has always has sort of reiterated something similar. The, count, the challenge continues to be how we quantify in monetary terms the value of, of data being used. Um, and so how can we attach these sort of more realistic values to the return on investments. Maybe that's something that spills over to the sort of the high level forum discussion of financing a little bit later, but maybe just to keep things general for, uh, for the folks who are participating in this panel, um, can you, do you have any um, thoughts about sort of how sort of more of this user focus on user can perhaps better allow us to sort of quantify and demonstrate the value of the statistics being produced. So does um, anyone want to start first? I don't want to go in the same order over and over again. It's not fair. So let me start with Francesca. She has a smile on her face, which probably means she has an answer in her heart. I don't know if I have an answer in my heart. I know this is a million dollar questions <laughs> question, right? We're always talking about how do we demonstrate the value of data? But I think uh, by, by doing what we discussed today, all, everything that the framework uh, has outlined in terms of improving the data use, by doing that, we can also demonstrate the, the value of data because the more we use data, the more our data are relevant and connected to citizens and to what the real demand is. And the more we satisfy that demand with the right products, with the right tools, with the right visualization, with the right dissemination presentations, et cetera, et cetera, the more citizens and the public will, will understand and will demand the data. So it becomes, it, that's when I say, you know, the development of this new culture where data, uh, the, the citizens are owners and that also users at the same time. So I think that's a whole process that we need to, to fulfill and to establish and to achieve so that uh, ultimately you have better demand, more focused demand, and it's easier to demonstrate the impact and the value for our policymakers. But then ultimately, of course, it's a question of uh, uh, the right uh, support, financing and, and, and funding, both domestically and, and internationally, to be able to do all that. Over. Yeah, um, yeah, we have one comment saying it is literally the million dollar question, but how many millions? I like that comment, so thank you. Um, do, do, do we have any others who would like to weigh in on this? Uh, Shada's got her hand up again, uh, so please, Shada. 
Um, yeah, I think this is this is something we've been discussing with Jose Antonio, and is at the heart of uh, it's, it's a very important point. So I don't want to uh, trivialize it or put it aside. But as Francesco said, we really need to sort of say uh, attaching dollar amount might be very difficult. So we have to find sort of like a proxy for the, uh, the for the value of data, whether it's high use, whether it's a sort of a, a composite of uh, various elements that we need to take into consideration. There are some very simple things. For example, um, in, uh, International Energy Association right now, we are pushing them to stop selling their energy data. And it's very simple because there's a high demand for them. They make $7 million a year of revenue. So it's very simple to say how that value, and we're trying to raise the money for them so that they can, you know, they can make it available free, uh, free of charge. So there are some um, uh, sort of, um, um, if you will, uh, if you will, anecdotal uh, value, dollar amount uh, attached to the value of data that we could continue using. But as we make data more and more open, it becomes public good that value is has to be uh, calculated in a different way than just the dollar amount because we're not selling that information anyway complex issue jose antonio will keep on talking to you about this if you have a proposal let us know and we would love to work on that thank you thanks shada um does anyone else want to jump in on this one um, I have one final question and then I'm going to wrap things up super fast. Um, and, uh, and, I, and this is a question from, from Misha Belkindis, another long, long and uh, uh, great colleague. Um, his question is sort of how do we create a climate in a country to insist that data and evidence is being used um, by policymakers? Because oftentimes for a host of different reasons, they don't. And so, you know, maybe I'll ask this of maybe I'll start with Claudia on this one, and maybe if you can just you know, given your experiences as as a, a director of data use and working in some a variety of different countries, if you could summarize something quite quickly. Thanks. Sure, and I think I think this does sort of reflect a little bit on on the last question because um, it, it's really about and we talk a lot about data driven decision making, but in reality we know that decision making isn't driven by data. Um, at the best, um, I think decisions will be informed by data, especially at, the, at that high level. And, and, and that's why we really must understand the political economy side of these things, because it's the political considerations around that that are really driving it. Um, but I, I, I do think this is a bit of a million dollar question as well. And my answer would be, actually, um, are, are we focusing at the right level? Because um, uh, going back to my presentation, that relentless focus on the national data user, if we can get data working at the point of service delivery, then we can actually measure the direct impact. And if it's being used there on the ground um, for service delivery, um, then we've got a much better chance of making the case for that to be flowing further up into those higher level political decisions. Great, and thank you very much. Um, so we have $2 million questions, so more food for thought for uh, the uh, financing for data issue that we will uh, get next week, I guess, in advance of the commission. I have now two minutes to wrap up, but that's okay, because I did a sort of quasi wrap up before the Q&A session. So really just three things at this stage. First of all, to the audience, Thank you very much for your participation, both in the poll and in, uh, and in, in your comments and in your, um, and your, just your interest in this uh, today. And as I uh, reiterated uh, a couple of minutes ago, we will be trying to send a questionnaire to keep you engaged. And please, 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 we'd be delighted if you could comment on the, um, on the live document that was put in the chat box, um, because I think uh, this really does have to be an inclusive process. So thank you for today's, per, uh, your participation today and your future participation in this endeavor. To our panelists and our presenters, thank you very much for your efforts. Um, we think we had a really, I think we had a really stimulating discussion. We, we covered a lot of different dimensions and we got some very interesting and provocative uh, comments from the audience. So thank you all of you for your work today. And I think thank you for the folks who've helped us stage this uh, behind the scenes. 
it's always a lot, uh, very, very complicated. So to both the UNSD, the trends team and uh, the ODW folks that made this all work quite seamlessly today, I thank you. So with that, we're wrapping up the session. Enjoy the rest of this year's Statistical Commission and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.